let me tell you what I'm about. Teacher reaching students to feel they on the out and out. Preaching words and verbs and academic sermons. Come along with me, take my hand, and do some learning. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Let's do some math. Today we're going to look at algebraic structures. A large part of that will be with the primary focus being on groups. All the algebraic structures that we'll care about will use a group as a foundation itself. So we'll spend the most time on groups. But we'll at the end talk about more general algebraic structures and see how they're all related. Let's just jump into what a group is. Let's start with a joke. What is every algebraist? favorite sport? The answer is ultimate frisbee. Why? Because it involves a group, a ring, the frisbee, and a field to play on. <laughs> Isn't that great? A group, a ring, and a field, and okay, i guessing you probably don't know what those are yet, so that's not so funny. But it will be funny by the end of the video. These are all examples of of what I'll call algebraic structures. This includes groups, but also rings, and fields are a special type. And then another structure not mentioned in this joke are modules. Now, we'll be spending most of the time looking at groups because they're, one, in some sense easier to work with because there is less to keep track of, and two, they're foundational to these other types. A ring involves a group with some extra structure, and a module also involves a group with some extra structure. So understanding groups is really paramount to understanding most of the algebraic structures that people tend to care about. So let's see, what is a group? Simply, a group is two things. It is a set, let's say G, along with a binary operation, where this operation takes something from their Cartesian product of G with itself to G. A very simple way to think about this, if this notation is off-putting, is that this operation, this star, takes two things from G, hence why we have G cross G. It's just two copies of G. It takes two things from G, combines them together in some way to give another thing in G. No matter who you are watching this video, you certainly know of many cases like this. Addition is such a thing. If you take addition of integers, that's taking two integers, adding them up, and then getting another integer. If you take multiplication of, let's say, real numbers, that's taking two real numbers, multiplying them together, and getting another real number. Here we've just listed this as a more general function. But for now, thinking of addition and multiplication are really good working examples to have in your mind. Besides a group having a set and a binary operation on that set, there also needs to be some properties satisfied, and there's three of them. The first is associativity, which we'll explain in a little bit more detail in a second. The next is identity, and the last is inverses. So associativity, identity, and inverses. Note, at the moment, there's no notion of commutativity. A group does not require commutativity. Now, what are these exactly? Well, for associativity, for all, for every triple of elements in G. So you have three things, A, B, and C. They're all in G. For any triple you come up with, it must be that the following equality holds. If you take and first compose B with C, then whatever that result is, you compose it with A, where it is important that A is on the left and stays on the left. We can't switch the order because that would be commutativity. But the way we group these, it shouldn't matter in of itself. So doing B compose C, taking that result, and then composing with A, where A is on the left, should be the same as if we composed A with B first, and then composed with C. So the grouping doesn't matter. As long as you keep A on the left, B in the middle, C on the right, and so on, whether you group B and C first, or A and B, should not matter. That's associativity. One way I like to think about this is who you associate with, who do you hang around with. In particular, imagine you are B. Is your friend C, is C the person you hang out with and A is a jerk and you don't want to hang out with A? Or is A the nice person and C's the jerk? So associativity compared to commutativity is who do you associate with? Does B associate with C or does B associate with A? 
That's a nice way to remember it. At least it works for me. Commutativity, on the other hand, will involve movement, will involve switching positions. But notice there's no position switching here. There's just grouping. And I belabor the point because it's really easy to confuse associativity with commutativity early on. Now, the next property of a group is identity. For there to be an identity, we mean there exists some element in G, which we'll call E, such that, this symbol just means such that, such that for all the elements in G, we have this equality. That if you compose E with G on the left, or whether you do it on the right, it's going to work out to be G either way. And a way to think about this, or to remember it, is E preserves the identity of every object. So we call E the identity, and in the colloquial sense, it preserves identity. Hence the name. So when we apply E to G, or compose E with G, it doesn't change G. It's a thing that does not change the elements. And that must be true for all the elements in G. Now you can technically get away with removing this part, or just you know doing one of the two. You could have just this, or you could have just this. And then you can derive the other part from it, but sometimes this is stated just to skip it because it's relatively straightforward to show that one gives the other. The last thing that a group requires, and part of the reason sometimes people will describe groups as capturing symmetry, is because there are inverses. So for every element of a group, you have something else, it's inverse. So for all elements of G, there exists something and notice we're not claiming how many things there exist, there just exists at least one thing, such that when you compose G and H, or H and G, either way, what you get out is the identity. Now this may seem very abstract at first, but we'll look at some examples and see that these are properties we've worked with all throughout school. As far as notating a group, we can do it in one of two ways. We can denote it as this pair, G and the operation star, or in some cases when the operation is really clear and we know what type of group we're talking about, as a shorthand, we'll just simply write G. Now there are many, many groups. The reason we're looking at a group now is because they're so ubiquitous in mathematics. They're just everywhere. And the reason people came up with the definitions to begin with is because they're so omnipresent in mathematics that having this definition is very useful. You can hardly walk two feet in mathematics without stumbling into a group. So being able to say something about them in general is helpful because then we don't have to look at so many isolated cases and prove different things. We can just prove general results for groups and say whenever we encounter a group, all right, now we know some things about it. Since there are so many groups, we of course can't list them all, but a few that we'll look at are the mattress flipping group, which is kind of a classic small cardinality group. This group here, which is Z2 cross Z2. Then we'll look at dihedral groups and symmetric groups. There are other things such as cyclic groups. There are other quaternions and lots of fun stuff. But we'll look at these because it's a nice variety, but yet is also somewhat manageable. For the first example, let's consider the mattress flipping group. In the last video, we looked at a case of mattress flipping. That ended up with a set of four elements, which we'll denote by M here. Recalling that alpha was flipping the mattress, like pulling it up and then putting it back down. Beta was rotating it 180 degrees. And this is the combination of the two. We argued there were no other possible arrangements of the mattress. So there were only four distinct things. Where again, E was just do nothing to the mattress, just leave it. In order to check that this, along with composition, where we just either do one flip and then a rotation or do rotation and flip or do ro two rotations. We just do two movements where E is the movement of doing nothing. So our composition rule is just to do a movement and then do another movement. To check that this is a group, we have to check associativity, identity, and inverses. First, associativity. Now there's usually a lot to check with associativity. So if it's something that's tedious, and not terribly enlightening, often it's skipped. That's going to be the case here. The reason being is there are four elements of this group, and there's three positions they need to be in. That gives us four to the third equalities to check, and we just don't want to check all those. 
So trust me that in this case, associativity does hold. More manageably, if we think about the identity, E does act as the identity, both in an intuitive way. It's the movement of doing no movement. So if you, let's say, do a flip and then no movement, it was the same as doing a flip. But if we just formally check, checking each of the elements of M and then composing them with the identity, we see that we get just these elements back. And this is true if we compose with E on the left, that is we do some movement here and then do the nothing movement. It's as if we just never had the nothing movement. It's the same thing if we start with the nothing movement and then compose. So now we've checked everything we need for the identity. The last thing is inverses. Going back to the composition table, looking at the mattress flipping what was originally a set, and then now we're claiming as a group. I claim that the element E has inverse itself, the element alpha has inverse itself, beta has inverse itself, and alpha composed beta has inverse itself again. The reason being is if we take each of these and we compose them with themselves, going back to the composition table, we see that in each case we end up with the identity. Flipping the mattress over and then doing exactly the same flip will bring it back to its original position. Turning it 180 degrees and then doing so again, of course, is like turning it 360 degrees. And one can check that doing a flip and then a turn is the same thing as doing another flip and another turn. Then one can check that doing a flip and turn followed by another flip and turn will bring back to the original position. Now we've checked three properties. We've checked associativity. Well, we didn't actually check that, but I claim that that will work. You can go through the four to the third different equations, but or you can trust me that it works. We did check the identity and we did check inverses. We have a set, we have a composition, and the composition satisfies this. That means that M, with the composition of just doing two moves after another, that that's a group. So that's good. So we have the mattress flipping group. Now let's look at a group where some of the components may be unfamiliar to you, but it will be a good chance to learn some important concepts that show up in groups all the time. Now let's say we have Z2 cross Z2 with binary operation, like so, and the binary operation is defined in this way. If we take an element A1, A2, where the A1 is an element of Z2 here, A2 is an element of Z2 here, B1 is an element of this Z2, B2 is an element of this Z2. If we take this ordered pair, where the first ordered pair is from this Z2 cross Z2, the second ordered pair is from this Z2 cross Z2, if we look at what that pair maps to, the first pair from this copy, the second pair from this copy, it's going to map to another ordered pair, one way we can write that is either star of the pair of pairs, or we can write the element star the element. I think I'll tend to favor this notation, but this may sometimes be used as well. Now what this will amount to, or how we're defining it, is like so. This is sometimes called component-wise addition, or component-wise multiplication, or component-wise composition. We take the first component of each of these two, the First component is A1 here, first component is B1, and we add them together modulo 2. In the other case, we take A2 and B2, the second components of each pair, we add those components together. Now you may be asking, and I wouldn't be surprised or upset, if you say what is Z2? And what is addition with this little 2 at the bottom? And part of the reason I bring this whole group up is one, to show that you can have some kind of interesting composition rules like so, and to introduce this very important group and this very important concept. Now, if you've heard of modular arithmetic before, this is addition mod 2. This is the group of integers. This is the set of integers mod 2, which is just 0 and 1, which we'll look at in more detail in a second. But even if you have not heard the terms explicitly modular arithmetic, you certainly deal with it every single day. When we say it's 1 p.m., what we're actually saying is it's 13 hours past the most recent midnight. So what we do is we look at 13 and we say, once we've surpassed 12, we take away 12. So 7 p.m. is actually 19 hours past midnight. In military time, sometimes we'll say 1900, but commonly in civilian time at least, 
we would subtract 12 until we get to a number that's 12 or less. So 19 is larger than 12, we subtract 12 and we get down to 7. It's the exact same idea here. But let's look at it in more detail just to make sure it's really clear. Asking the question, what is Z2? Well, in general, Zn is the set of positive is the set of non-negative integers 0, 1, 2, up until we get to n minus 1. Looking at z2 really quick, of course, that's going to be 0 and 1. We call n the modulus. And the way to think about this is you take the integers, and as soon as you reach n or above, or if you start negative, you're going to add and subtract n a number of times until you get to one of these numbers, which are called the least residues. Essentially, add n or subtract n enough times until you get to one of these numbers. Again, these are called the least residues. For instance, say we have z here in the middle. The integers, of course, are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., going positively. Going negatively is negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and so on. If we look at z2, what we're saying is we take the number and we look at how many times we have to subtract or add the modulus so that we get down to one of the least residues. The least residues of z2 are 0 and 1. So say we have 2 here. 2 is not 0 and 1. So what we do is we subtract 2 however many times we need to or add it until we get down to either 0 or 1. And of course, if you subtract 2 from 2, you get down to 0. Same thing with 3. 3 is not 0 or 1, so we add or subtract 2 as many times as we need until we get down to one of the least residues. The least residues in the case of z2 are 0 and 1. We subtract 2 from 3 till we get down to 1. With 4, we subtract 2 twice. Subtracting once would take us down to 2, but 2 is not a least residue, so we subtract it again and get down to 0. Let's say we have negative 5. Negative 5 is not a least residue, which for z2 are 0 and 1. So now we add and we subtract 2, however many times we need, until we get to a least residue. If we take negative 5 and subtract 2, we'll get down to negative 7, so subtracting won't work, or won't get us where we want to be. So we add 2 to negative 5, getting us to negative 3, then we do it again, we get to negative 1, and then we do it again, and finally we get to 1 here. And now you'll see that we just have this repeating sequence of least residues. We go 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, etc. Alternatively, if we looked at Z3, the modulus is 3, then we subtract or add 3 enough times until we get to one of the least residues for Z3. The least residues are 0, 1, and 2. So for instance, 5, we subtract 3 once and we get down to 2. With negative 5, we subtract 3 and get down to negative 8, so subtracting won't work. But if we take and we add 3 to negative 5, we get to negative 2. Negative 2 is still not a least residue, so we add 3 again. Or we've added a total of 6, and that brings us to 1, which is a least residue. And just like we had up here where we have this pattern, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, of least residues, so too do we have here the pattern of 0, 1, 2. So we go 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and it will just repeat forever like that. Because all you're doing is you're shifting each of these numbers by the modulus enough times to get down to one of the least residues. Now we define addition, or later multiplication, modulo n in the following way. Addition, at least, and multiplication would work very similarly. We would say addition from zn cross zn to itself is taking two elements where x and y are each from zn, so you can say x is from the first copy, y is from the second copy. We add those up, modulo n, we just find the least residue of the normal sum. So we add them up like normal in the way we would usually expect, and then we just find the least residue. For example, if we take 7 and 12 and we add them up, modulo 4, that's going to be equal to 3 which we can alternatively write in another notation like this, saying 7 plus 12 is congruent to 3 modulo 4. But this is really saying the exact same thing. Now how this works is, if it's not clear, you take 7 plus 12 and just normally, of course that's going to give us 19. Now 19 is not a least residue 
mod 4. The least residues mod 4 are 0, 1, 2, and 3. So what we want is to have a least residue. How we get there is exactly the same way as what we just saw on the previous page. We subtract 4, which is the modulus since we're working mod 4 or modulo 4. And we go from 19 to 15. 15 is still not a least residue mod 4. So we subtract 4 again. 11 is not a least residue of 4. We subtract 4 again. 7 is not a least residue of 4. We subtract 4 again. And now we have reached a least residue of 4. So addition and actually subtraction and multiplication and all those common operations work the same as they usually would with the exception that we always reduce it down to the least residue. Now let's return to the suggested set and binary operation that we're going to claim is a group. So we have the set Z2 cross Z2, and we have the binary operation. Now remember, binary operations take whichever set you're looking at, and they take two copies of it so that you can compose two elements together to get another element. Addition takes two integers that you add together to get another integer. So in this case, we start with this set. We take two copies of that set, and we're going to meld elements together to get more copies in the set, more elements in the set. Now Z2 cross Z2, Z2 itself is simply made up of zero and one. If we take two copies of Z2, that means we have two copies of elements of Z2. That is, we have ordered pairs where the first element is zero or one and the second element is zero or one. So we have a zero or one here and a zero or one here. And all the possible combinations, since there's two in each, we multiply two by two and we get four different possibilities. So what does this operation look like? Well, this composition, which we'll call star two, if we take two example elements, say zero one and one one, what this amounts to is adding them up modulo two component wise. So we take the first element zero and the first element one, and that will become the new first element when we add them together. We then take the second element of each of these ordered pairs, which is a 1 and then a 1, and then we add those up, modulo 2. Of course, 0 plus 1, modulo 2, is just going to give us 1, because 0 plus 1 is 1, and that's already a least residue, mod 2. And then if we take 1 plus 1, that's of course 2, and if we reduce that mod 2, we'll get 0. This will give us the element 1, 0. All right, now in order to be a group, we need to check three properties of this composition. We need to check associativity, we need to check identity, and then we need to check inverses. Like before, let's leave associativity just because it's pretty tedious and I don't think terribly enlightening, just because it's a little more tedious than we'd like for this video. But let's take the identity. Now, here are all the different elements in color of Z2 cross Z2, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now let's take the element 0, 0, compose it with each of these, and see what we get. Well, you can just imagine, in each case, you start with this color element here, and you add to each of the components 0. Well, adding 0 won't change it, so what you get out in the end is the exact same element. That shows that the element 0, 0 is the identity, or a identity, as it were. Alternatively, with inverses, Let's say we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, the elements of this Z2 cross Z2. And let's say we want to find their inverses. Well, I claim if you just take the composition of each one with itself, what you'll get out is 0, 0. Mmm, interesting. Seen this before we have. Indeed, Yoda. Where have we seen this before? Where we have a four element set composing each element with itself gives the identity back. Hmm. Now let's look at another group based on some geometry. Dihedral groups are an interesting set of groups. And in general, we say that D sub N is the group of geometric symmetries of a regular n-gon. A regular three-gon would simply be an equilateral triangle. If I squint at this triangle, I don't think it's perfectly equilateral, but I mean it to be. It's just I can't draw it perfectly with the snap tool here. D4 would be a square, where all the sides are of equal length. D5 should be a pentagon, 
where all the sides are of equal length, and I see that they're definitely not here, but I mean them to be all sides of equal length. D6 would be a hexagon, all sides equal length, and so on. The regular means that all sides are of equal length. Sometimes you will see the symmetries of the triangle represented by D6, the symmetries of the square represented as D8, this would be D10, and so on. You'll see both notations. I like DN because it tells you the number of vertices. If it was represented as D6, the reason why there would be a 6, why it would be doubled, is because we'll find the number of elements in DN, as we've written it here, is 2N. But for us, this N will represent the number of vertices of the regular object we're looking at. Now say we look at D4. With the composition of composing two movements of a geometric object to get a new symmetry. This is exactly the same composition idea as the mattress flipping group. We do a movement of an object to get a symmetry, and then we do another movement of the object to again get another symmetry. Now D4, I'm going to claim, has eight elements listed like so. Now, without further explanation, these shouldn't make any sense, but let's, of course, explain. If you start with the square, there are two fundamental things I claim that you can do with this square. And there's slight modification to how you define these, but in essence, there's going to be two essential things. One thing is to rotate this square. If we rotate it, let's say clockwise, we get this object here. We notice the A moves to the B position, the B moves to the C position, and so on and so forth. So A gets moved to where B was, that's why A is here. B gets moved to where C was, that's why B is here, and so on. Up here, we have R, R2, R3, or R squared and R cubed. What that will mean, and we'll give more explanation shortly, what that will mean is that we do a rotation just once. Here we do it twice, so do a rotation once, and then do another rotation. Here we do a rotation once, then twice, then three times, and so on. Now you see an S in this set of elements. There's another fundamental movement we can do, and that's to reflect this object across this axis. Now there's choice in the axis that you pick. You could pick it to be straight down the middle, horizontal, you know, this diagonal, and so on. It doesn't matter, as long as you're consistent, as long as you're always going about the same axis. We'll choose this one for no apparent reason. Now if we take this and reflect it about this magenta axis, notice A and C are going to say it in the same position, where B and D are going to switch positions. So that's why we get A and C staying the same, B and D switching. And this we call S. It's a reflection across the axis that we've shown here. Now just to clarify, if we have an element SR, and then we have an element r cubed. What we mean by that is sr is simply the composition of s then r. So that would mean reflect and then rotate. r cubed would be rotate, then rotate, and then rotate. So perform s then r, or perform r three times in a row. If we do e, that's the same as doing nothing. Just like with the mattress flipping. It's the leave it in place. If we do R, of course, we see what we get. It's just this here. If you do it one more time, you see that A is going to move to the bottom right corner, which there we go, and everything else will follow suit. Do it again. A will move to the bottom left corner. D will move to the bottom right. There we go. Alternatively, we could have started with just a reflection, which we've seen here, but now do a reflection and then a rotation. So we did a reflection and then a rotation. Or we do one reflection to start with and then two rotations and then three. Now I claim this is all the possible symmetries we can have. The reason being is that kind of like the mattress flipping argument, we can just focus on which letter is in a given corner. Let's say the upper left corner. Now if A is in the upper left corner, there's only two possibilities of what else can happen. You can have B to its right, or because we're working with a regular object here and we can do this uh, flipping, we can do this reflection, we could have B be in the top right, or we see up here A is in the top left, but now B is in the bottom left. When A is in the top left corner, there are two possibilities. And that's true of everything. When D is in the top left corner, 
there are two possibilities. When C is in the top left corner, there are two possibilities. So two for each letter being in the top left corner, there are four different letters, two times four is eight. This will be true of every single dihedral group. However many vertices you have, since you're working with a regular n-gon, you can use a similar argument, or argue in general, the number of elements will be twice the number of vertices. Now let's look at symmetric groups. This is arguably one of the most important types of groups. And a reason for that is later one can show that any group can be mapped into a symmetric group. So in some sense, symmetric groups contain all the groups that you would want, in, in a very general sense. Now what is a symmetric group? It's actually the set of all n cycles. So it's really about permutations. Sn will take to mean the set of all n cycles. So we have, if we have S3, it's all three cycles. If we have S4, it's all four cycles. Now the terminology cycles may not be as resonant in your mind, but S3 alternatively means all the ways you can permute three objects. So when you see n cycles, that's just another terminology for a permutation on n objects. If we, let's say, look at S3, the set is going to be like this. You can check that this is the permutation where 1 goes to 1, 2 goes to 2, and 3 goes to 3. This is just cycle notation representing that permutation. This one, on the other hand, is the permutation where 1 gets sent to 2, 2 gets sent to 3, and 3 gets sent to 1. If they're in a single set of parentheses, it's a cascading set of information where 1 gets mapped to 2, 2 gets mapped to 3, and so on. If something is alone in a set of parentheses, that means it gets mapped to itself. Alternatively, over here, we have the, and sorry for not having a comma here, there should be a, a comma so that there's six distinct things. The cycle here means we take and we send one to two, we send two back to one, so remember everything at the end, or anything at the end, maps back to the thing at the beginning. So we have 1 and 2 essentially being swapped places, and then 3 stays in place. Here, 1 and 3 are swapped places, 2 stays in place. Here, 2 gets mapped to 3, 3 gets mapped to 2. That's what I mean when I say they swap places, and 1 stays in place. So there are six different possible permutations. The reason that's so is because it's 3 factorial, as we mentioned before, and you can check that all these are distinct. Besides having a set, we also need a composition rule. The composition rule we'll have here is simply composition of permutations. So you have one permutation, which is a bijection from, in this case, the set of three elements to the set of three elements. And then you have another permutation of three elements. So you just compose the permutations together like you would normally with functions. Suppose we have this permutation that switches one and three, Two stays the same. And then we have this permutation where one goes to two, two goes to three, and then three goes to one. Say we want to compose these two three cycles. What we'll say is that one, two, three, compose one, three, and then two is the same as doing first this permutation and then this permutation. So keep in mind that we're thinking of working with this as going right to left. Just like functions that are nested, they have a switching of the order. You do the thing on the right before the thing on the left. First we do the cyan permutation, and then we do the magenta permutation. Let's see what we get in the end. We notice that one gets mapped to three, and then carrying three over here, we see that three gets mapped to one. So 1 started out as itself, gets mapped to 3, carry it over, gets mapped back to 1. In the end, 1 gets mapped to 1. Now likewise, with 2, 2 gets mapped to itself. Then we carry 2 over to the second permutation, and then we see 2 gets mapped to 3. Following this all the way through, 2 gets mapped to 2, carried over, gets mapped to 3. We start with 2 and we end with 3. That means that in the end, after the composition, 2 gets mapped to 3. Likewise, if we start with 3, 3 gets mapped to 1, carry 1 over, and then see that 2 
is what we map to from there. So three goes to one, one goes to one, and one goes to two. That means we start with three and we end with two. In terms of cycle notation, we see that we switch two and three, and then we leave one alone. So now we have our set, S3, and we have a rule of composition. In order to check that this is indeed a group, we would need to find a identity element. That's this here. We would need to check associativity, and then finally check inverses. Checking inverses is not too difficult. One can just do a computational check. I think what you'll find is that the identity is always its own inverse. These two are each other's inverse. And then I think each one of these is its own inverse. So here we've explored the algebraic structure of a group. There are other algebraic structures as well that we'll look at. But one important thing to note is for a given algebraic structure, if you have two different representations of that structure, could they in fact be the same? That is, could you have two different groups that look completely different, but are in some sense exactly the same group? Or are they similar in some way? In order to check whether two sets were the same, whether they had the same cardinality, what we did was we found a bijection between them. You might say, well, can we do the same thing with groups? Are two groups the same if there's a bijection between them? But that is 100% not the case. The reason being is a group has more structure. It's a set plus a binary operation. So when we're working with maps between groups, in order to talk sensibly about these maps, we want them to preserve the structure of the groups. A group homomorphism between two groups, let's say G with composition star G, and h with composition star h, it's a map or a function, function meaning exactly the same thing as a map. It's a function or map phi from g to h, such that no matter what two elements of g that you have, when you take the composition first in g, then apply phi, it's the same as if you applied phi first to each element individually, and then use the composition of h. We'll explore this diagrammatically in a second, but this is something known as structure preserving. So I can't stress enough, structure preserving is how you want to think about this. Remember a group is a set, G, that has what we call extra structure because there's a composition rule that has some properties. Namely, it has associativity, identity, and inverses. That's what we call the structure on the set G. We could just have G and then no composition rule, and then it would just be some set. We think of it as basically being unstructured or just not having anything built on top of it or anything interesting going on. Most of the time, sets themselves are just kind of boring. But if you add this composition rule, now things become interesting. You're adding more restrictions, but that gives it a structure, which is often very beautiful. Now, if you have two groups, you have two different composition rules. You have the composition rule over here, and then you have the composition rule over here. So besides having a function or map from just this set to this set, we also want it to behave in this nice way to interact with this, the structure of G and H. That's called structure preserving. Say it with me. Structure preserving. Structure preserving. Structure preserving. Structure preserving. Here's how this works diagrammatically. Say we have a G1 and a G2. These could be the same, but in general they won't be. Suppose that we map under phi to elements phi of g1 and then phi of g2. Now we do this separately. First do it with g1 to get phi of g1, then do it with g2 to get phi of g2. Once we've mapped each one individually, we then combine them in h. So we say combine these together, and what we get out is this composition, where we use the composition rule of h, since we're living in h in the bottom diagram. Alternatively, we could start in G by combining one in G1 and G2 to get G1 star G, G2, where we do the composition within G, and then it should be that once you map with phi, you get the same thing. When we're working in G, we have to work with the composition of G. When we're working in H, we have to work with the composition of H. So it is to say whether you do the composition while you're just in G, and then you do the mapping, or whether you work with the composition 
after you've already landed in H, either way you should end up in the same place. So notice we follow to here, or we follow to here, and it should end up in the same place. Now there's always a trivial group homomorphism. Say you're sending the group Z2, note just Z2, with addition mod 2, to the symmetric group S3 with its composition of permutations. The rule is that we send x no matter what x is, and there's just two things. There's only 0, 1 in the set Z2. So whether it's 0, we send it to the trivial permutation, or the identity permutation, the thing that maintains the identity of everything. That is the identity of S3. And if it's 1, you also send it to the same identity. That is, if we take 0 under phi, we send it to E. 1 under phi, we send it to E. Notice that phi of 0 is the same thing as 0 plus 0. Same thing as 0 plus 1 is 1 plus 0. And 1 plus 1 gives us each of these here. And then we observe if we take the combination as permutations, we get E compose E, which is E. That is to say, notice that if we have 0 here and 0 here, which corresponds to 0 here and 0 here, whether we do the composition with the permutation composition, we get this element E of S3, or whether we do the addition mod 2 first, because that's the operation in this first group, and then we do phi afterwards, what we get is also E. So the E's over on the left are the E's over on the right, they're the same. If any of these differed, then this would not be a group homomorphism. And just the color to make it clear, we have the operation of the first group, which I've colored in green here, and then the operation of the second group, which I've colored in cyan here. And then I've colored the zeros just to make it easier to keep track of the individual elements. But notice whether we take 0, 0 with the first operation, and then phi, or we take them individually, then apply the second operation, star here, we get E and we get E. And that's true in all of these cases. This is again a case of structure preserving. We define a group isomorphism as something a little bit stronger than a group homomorphism. In fact, it is a group homomorphism with one extra condition, namely that it's bijective. If we had, let's say, two groups like so, and they both contain three elements, we would say a group isomorphism is a bijective map from G to H, but not just bijective, it also needs to be structure preserving. And if we have such an instance, what we might say in that case is that really, they're the same group, but with different labels on their elements. So though two groups may look wildly similar, if there's a group isomorphism between them, mathematically, they're identical groups. We've just chosen to call their elements by different names and describe them in a different manner. But they behave in every sense of the word as groups in exactly the same way. Now, we've looked at groups this whole time, but there are important other structures. However, as we'll see, they're all really based on a group. Let's take a look. So the three structures we'll look at are group, ring, and then a R module. First of all, a group has a single operation. It's a binary operation where that operation is associative, there's an identity, and all the elements under that operation have inverses. In the case of a ring and an R module, they'll each have two operations. With a ring, there's an operation that we often denote as plus, like addition, because it essentially acts just like addition. But then we'll also have a dot, which we'll call multiplication, that acts similarly to how we usually think of multiplication. And then we need to have some rules for how these two interact with each other. How do these two operations behave when they interact with one another? The addition on a ring is the addition on a ring is associative, has identity, which we denote zero of R because zero is the identity of addition in the traditional sense. So we call it the zero of the ring. It also has inverses, but it is also commutative. The order does not matter when you're using this operation. Now let me really stress. 
We have commutativity of this operation, of the plus operation. That will not be the case for multiplication. That will decidedly not be the case. All we have for the multiplication for sure is that it's associative. Now, there are other properties that the multiplication could have, but that will result in rings with other names, such as a ring with unit if there's an identity, or a commutative ring if this multiplication is commutative, and so on. But at its base level, we only assume associativity, with the exception that some authors, since they, for whatever reason, only care about rings with a unit, or they only care about commutative rings, and so on, they may include some of these definitions. But I think the biggest standard is to only have associativity. And, and I say think, I mean there are many cases where there is only associativity, and that seems to be, from what I can tell, the the base standard, but you may see it written with extra conditions. Now, the way these two interact together is through distributivity. That, in this case, looks like so. If we do the sum operation and then multiply outside by some element, where we multiply is this operation, so we take the sum and then we do dot t, that's the same as if we distributed from the right in the way we usually think of distribution over addition from multiplication. And there's left distributivity too. So this is how the dot operation or multiplication interacts with the plus sum addition operation in this case. Now, if you want to add other properties, you can get other types of rings. And namely, it's all going to be modifications to the multiplication operation. If you have all of these, there is no doubt, there's complete consensus that what we'll have is something called a field. So if you have an identity, just that in of itself, adding that would be a ring with a unit. Inverses, I'm actually not sure if there's a special name for that, but if it's commutative, it's a commutative ring. If you individually have these properties, like if you just had the identity, but not inverses and commutative, you'd say a ring with a unit. But if you combine all three and you add each one of them, for sure what you have is something called a field. So here we now can complete having a laugh over the joke. What is an algebraist's favorite sport? It's ultimate frisbee because you play in a field using a ring and you need a group to do it. The one thing I don't like about that joke is it actually doesn't capture all of the core algebraic structures. Groups and rings are certainly a big deal, but our modules in many cases are just as big of a deal, if not more so, than the others. Though do note, a ring and what we'll see in an R module both depend on having a group. Notice this is the conditions for a group. So is this, with the exception that it's also commutative, or what we call an abelian group. So this ring R is a group under addition with the added bit that is also commutative. For an R module, we actually have exactly the same thing, where we're associative, there's an identity, we have inverses, and it's commutative. So a group doesn't have commutativity by itself, but when we look at a ring in a field, under the operation of addition, we will have that it's a commutative group. So R, if you have a ring, is also under addition, commutative group or an abelian group saying the same thing. An R module under its addition or sum operation is also a commutative or abelian group. All of these structures involve a group at least. The ring and the R module just add extra. The ring adds a multiplication like this. An R module adds a scalar multiplication. So notice the difference between these two multiplications. We have R cross R giving us an R. Here, we have R cross M giving us an M. Now, I should say, what R are we talking about here and here? An R module is always based on having a ring itself. So this R here is indeed a ring as if you had here. That's important when we define this scalar multiplication, where we take the ring and we'll multiply elements of the ring by elements of the module M, and then return ourselves to a module M. This has the associative property, along with an identity, where the identity comes from the ring. 
So if we take the ring identity, where it's the identity under multiplication up here, and we multiply that by x using this multiplication, what we get back is x, where x would come from m, the ring identity comes from r, and the element you end up with is an element of m. So in both cases, we have associative. And in the case of an R module where R is a ring, we assume that the ring has a, a unit or a multiplicative identity and that it behaves sort of in the way you might expect. And just like in the case of a ring, we want our two operations to work together. And in order to do so, we, we have a quote unquote distributive property where it looks very similar to this. But because this is working with all elements of R and this one has a mix of R and M, it looks a little different, but the idea is largely the same. There's a special type of R module that instead of having a ring, you could imagine having R be a field. So if you had a field and all the other properties were satisfied, what we would call that is a vector space. So there's groups, rings, and R modules where R is a ring. And then in special cases, you can have a ring be a field. So it's a special type of ring, a field. Or you could have a vector space, which is a special type of R module, where that R is a field. And then I won't list it here, but there's a final type of algebraic structure, which is a algebra. The hierarchy is you have a group. From a group, you can get a ring. From a ring and a group, you can get an R module. And then from the combination of these two, you can get something called an algebra. And an algebra is something that is both a ring and an R module. So groups allow you to define rings and R modules. And if you combined rings and R modules, you get something called an algebra. So an algebra has three operations, has a sum, a internal multiplication, if you will, a scalar or external multiplication, and then it satisfies all the properties one might expect it to satisfy to fit all this criteria. I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you in the next video.